When you think about tension on a rope, what do you think of first? The first thing I think about is tug of war. Have you ever played tug of war? It's so much fun. Um, there's two different teams or two different people and you're both pulling on the rope and you're trying to see which one of you can pull the other one past whatever marker you make it saying, you know, Usually there's a line somewhere, and if you cross the line, then you win the center point of the rope, okay? Or you just pull till the other team falls down. That's fun too, okay? That's tug of war, and that's a tension on the rope trying to see who will win. But there's another way that tension is used, and one example of that is like on a sailboat. Um, on a sailboat, you have ropes all over the place, and they need to be tight, tension on the ropes, but not too tight and not too loose either. Otherwise, it doesn't work right, but it needs to be taut is what they call it, taut rope um, for sailboats so that they can function the way they need to and work. Um, and it's not like tug of war where one needs to win and the other one needs to lose. Rather, the both sides are pulling um, and there's tension on that rope, but they're working together, the two of them together with that tension to do. Wow, that's a really weird background. I don't know where that came from. Having that tension in the on the rope um, so that they can work together and accomplish a certain purpose and do a certain thing. There are tensions like that in scripture. And um, if you're thinking of it, one of those tensions, write it down in the comments below and let me know what tension you're thinking of. The one we're talking about today is the tension between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Or put another way, God's part in our part. <laughs> okay, that's what we're talking about today. And we're going to do that by asking the questions, How uh, do you know what you believe and what you need to do? And do you know how to do it? Now, just a quick reminder, if you want a family discussion guide to go along with this uh, Bible study, um, click the link in the description or the QR code to join the PRM e-team. Hi, friends. I'm Miss Nancy Ruth. And I'm Mr. Roger. We want to see kids living for Jesus. So let's look first at the first couple of verses in our passage. It says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to, uh, in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, some of you who've been following along for a while might have some questions here, um, because I talk a lot about how you can't earn your way to heaven. And that's, so how does that fit with this work out your salvation thing? <laughs> then Nancy Ruth, you're talking about both sides of your mouth, it doesn't work. <laughs> but listen, that's where our attention comes in. Listen to the first part. You're right. You can't earn your way into heaven. Watch this. Um, we know from a previous passage that we studied that Jesus humbled himself by being obedient to death on a cross, even death on a cross with the shame and the, the, the scorn and such that came with that. And he took our punishment on him when he died on that cross, but he didn't stay dead. He came back to life again three days later. And it was, it was proof that Jesus accepted that payment, that punishment for sin, and proof that he really is who he said he was, the divine, the, the divine, the son of God, fully God and fully man. And he could take that payment and pay for our sins like nobody else could. And we also know that with our um, verses like Romans 10.10 10 tell us it is with your heart that you believe in Jesus and are justified and made right with God. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Okay. And we see in like Ephesians 2.8, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. And it continues not as a result of work so that no one will boast. Okay. That's that God's part. Now here's that tension. Did you catch that tension with the not as a result of works so that no one will boast? So the salvation part, being saved, has nothing to do with you. It has to do with what Jesus did on the cross. That's God's part. Now here's our part. The very next verse in that Ephesians passage says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And um, James says it this way. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is just dead. <laughs> All right. Um, and that's that. We have that tension here for work. So faith, that part is believing in Jesus and what he did. And that part that had nothing to do with us, that was God's part. Believing in that. But then there's our part that comes with it. That's that tension. God's part, our part. Think of it like this. Okay. If you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. 
He changes your heart and then it overflows to show in the actions that we do, like a waterfall, okay? Um, that's that work out your salvation, the overflowing, the showing of our salvation. Uh, another way to think of it is like in this verse in Luke, it says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People did not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So how does this work? I mean, how, how does this even apply to us? And this is all very confusing, all this tension stuff, and I don't get it. Okay, Let me try to explain it a different way. Okay. Some people think they ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior and they're like, okay, I got my ticket to heaven. Now I can go live my life. I got that taken care of. Check and never really think about it again. That's not how this works. Okay. Um, in fact, James says specifically, you believe there is one God. Well, good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. They don't just say, oh yeah, I think there's a God, but they truly believe it and they shudder because of it. It's not enough to believe in God, and it's not enough just to know that Jesus is the Son of God and, and think that he really did die and all those things. There's more to it than that. In fact, we can see this because um, earlier in Acts, there, was some, there were some people trying to cast out demons, and they didn't really believe in Jesus. And the evil spirit responded to them, saying they were trying to cast out the demons in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches even though they didn't themselves believe. And the evil spirit responded to them and said, I recognize Jesus. Catch that. Didn't just hear about Jesus. They recognize Jesus. And they know about Paul. But who are you? <laughs> okay. So the demons recognize that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross to take punishment for sin, and he came back to life again. But they don't believe. He hasn't come into their heart. They haven't repented of their sin and allowed God to change them from the inside out. That's the difference. Okay. And when God changes us from the inside out, it shows in our actions and in our the things we say and do. James says it this way. He continues from that faith without works is dead. Okay. He says, are you willing to acknowledge, <laughs> you foolish person who thinks you can have faith without works, that faith without works is useless. Okay. So it's kind of like claiming that you're a chef. I'm a chef, but you never actually prepare any food. <laughs> Okay, you're not a chef if you don't prepare food, any kind of food. Okay, you've got to have the actions to go along with it. And that's the same thing with faith. Faith needs to show itself because God is working in our hearts and it overflows out into our actions. All right. Um, another way to think about it is like this. Um, sometimes um, you might have heard me talk about how some people think just put Jesus in their pocket. Jesus is a nice thing to kind of put in my pocket and just pull out when I need him or I need something. But otherwise, he can just hide in there and he doesn't need to be involved in all of my life. You can also think of it kind of like work gloves, okay? Um, I got my work gloves. I'm going to stick them in my pocket. But if I never actually use the work gloves and actually put them to work like they're supposed to be, what's the point <laughs> of having the work gloves? They don't, they're, they're not actually work gloves. They're just a decoration unless you actually use them. In the same way, we can think of our faith, okay? If we tr truly trust and believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we've repented and turned from our sin and trusted in him and given him our lives, it should show there should be evidence of Christ at work in our hearts. There should be evidence of Christ at work in our lives. That's what this verse is talking about. This passage is talking about. There should be fruit. People should be able to see that there is Christ living in us. If we're still doing the same old um, bad patterns and nothing is changing, that's a problem because God still hasn't, we haven't allowed God to work in our hearts. Okay. That's that work out our salvation. Let, let allowing God to continue to work in our lives and, and come out, let that come out in our words and in our actions. All right. And, but look, this isn't just up to us. Look at this second part. It says, for it is God who works in you. When we ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, he promises the Holy Spirit who comes to live inside of us. God himself comes to live within us when we ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. And we dedicate our lives to him.
And he works in our hearts and in our lives to continue to make us more and more like Jesus. Um, that's that God's part and our part one more time. Yeah, we're supposed to um, allow God to change our hearts and put that into practice in the things we say and do. But God's the one that helps us to do that. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So we're not on our own. It's not just up to us. God is the one that does that with us and for us and working in us. But we have to allow him to do it. Okay. And so it's not in our own strength. It's not um, thinking, well, I have to be better. Okay. It's not a matter of I have to be better and I have to do this and this and this and this. No, no, no. It's allowing God to, to reveal in our hearts things that need to change, things that we need to do that we're not doing, things that we need to stop doing that we are doing, and attitudes and things that need to change. Let, allow God to show us that and allow him to change that in us. And he gives us the power to do it. Okay. And remember that Holy Spirit working in our hearts to sanctify us, to make us more and more like Jesus until we are made perfect in Christ when we go and join him in heaven. Okay. And that is how that evidence comes out, that, that working out where everybody can see Christ is at work in that heart and in that life, in you and in me. Okay. Now, um, this passage in Philippians goes on to, to give some examples of what that would look like. Paul says, do everything without grumbling, without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Basically means it's not um, most people grumble and complain and argue. We are to be different. And that's part of that evidence that Christ working in our hearts and in our lives. And it also goes on to say, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. I don't have my Bible in front of me. It's at my desk. but That's part of why we spend time in God's word with him. Praying, yes. Talking to God, yes. But also allowing him to talk to us through the written scriptures, through the Bible, through spending time with him in his word every day and holding firm to that word of life and to the gospel, which is part of what the Bible explains all throughout scripture. And then catch this. This one, uh, it goes up. Paul goes on to say, then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sac on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, which means his life is coming to a close. OK, he sees that his life is coming to a close. I am glad and rejoice with all of you, even though he sees his death is coming. So you, too, should be glad and rejoice with me. Why? Why? Why can Paul rejoice in the suffering in the in the um, we've talked about how he's been going through some really hard things in his life. He's in in jail and he's he's you know, it's, it's <laughs> he's he's dealt with a lot in his life because of the gospel persecution, people not liking what he said and not just not liking it, but actively trying to stop him and hurt him to get him to be quiet. And to stop telling people about Jesus and living for Christ and showing people what this looks like. But he continues to do that. And he can rejoice in it because of the hope we have in Christ, like we talked about in a previous video. Because of the hope we have in Christ and because he has been able to disciple and share Christ with the people of the Philippian church and with others and help them to see the hope that they too can have in Christ. That makes all of the suffering worth it because he's glorifying God for the work God has been doing in his life and the way he, God has used him to reach others and work in their lives. Because of that, we can rejoice. That's an attitude that people around us, the world and the culture around us doesn't understand. But we can have that because of Christ working in our life, rejoicing in hardship and, and difficult situations because it's an opportunity for us to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ just like we saw in a previous video. If you want to learn more about how the Holy Spirit works in our life, check out this video. If you want to know more about um, what Paul teaches about suffering and rejoicing, check out whoops, this video, and I'll link the playlist to the rest of our um, Philippians videos as well. Don't forget to subscribe. We post memory verses in four translations, key passages, answers to Bible questions, and more. Check out our store and freebies at parentroadmin.com. We love you, friends. See you next time.